Okay. <laughs> All right, we're ready to rock and roll here. I um, just want to welcome everybody today to our um, first of our spring programs with the extension seminars and yeah, really good timing. I'm actually going to start to feel warmer today, so we're going to begin to feel like we can. Well, it snows later. We can, well, hey, day at a time. <laughs> That's the model. So we're going to start to look at you know some of our options for our own gardening, but this is a, a ter tremendously interesting program. Um, it's been around. Well, we'll hear how long it's been around, but it's gone through different paths and different iterations, and it's going through some really major changes that will probably influence what a lot of us are doing down the road from here in terms of our own programming. So this should be a this is really good stuff. Um, looking forward to hearing all about it. So um, today's speaker is Sarah Bailey, and uh, she's the state program coordinator for the UConn Extension Master Gardener Program. Uh, she joined UConn 12 years ago um, as the Hartford County coordinator. She's a University of Vermont graduate and a certified uh, advanced master gardener and is also a Connecticut accredited nursery professional. She has worked in the horticultural industry for the last two decades as uh, variously a um, retail nursery manager, a private gardener, garden designer, and a consultant for several landscaping firms. And she currently serves as uh, on the education committee of the Connecticut Nursery and Landscape Association. So with that. And in my spare time, I play with dogs that are smarter than me. Ah, <laughs> thanks. That's every dog. <laughs> yeah, well, when you got a border collie in an Australian yeah. shepherd, yeah. you're smarter than me. Yeah. So good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, when we started this, it was talk about the Master Gardener program and what it does, and it evolved from there to talk about what you're doing for the future. So you're going to get a little bit of both. Some of you know this stuff. Ms. Quiz should be well versed in what we do, since she and I sat next to each other taking the class way back when. Mm -hmm. When was that? 1999. So, on any given summer day in Connecticut, one homeowner may be receiving information about the insect damage in his vegetable garden. Another may be asking questions about building a compost bin. And a third is finding out what plants are going to work in that sunny landscape of the new house that she just bought. At a farmer's market, you may have people learning about gardening in their own homes or gardening for kids or a particular pest problem that's going on. Or they may be working on a food production garden, such as the one we have in Bloomfield learning about the gardening skills, teaching other folks about gardening skills and producing up to 3,000 pounds of produce for food share. Or they may be renovating an urban lot that's going to become a uh, community garden for that Hartford neighborhood. Or they may be teaching at a local garden center about how to convert, in this case, it's how to convert your lawn to an organic farm. So who are these people and who are the master gardeners? UConn Extension Master Gardener Program, as it says up here, provides horticultural training to volunteers who then turn around and serve and educate their communities through research-based information, sustainable solutions, and participating in a variety of community projects. We take what is up here, the information, and we translate it down to the homeowner and work across to the homeowner in language and in concepts that they can understand and use. The program started in Washington State in 1972 at a time when, this is going to sound familiar, resources within extension were shrinking. <laughs> and a lot of extension at that point was really based on agriculture and on farming. And we had this boom in urban consumer interest in gardening. One of those cyclical back to the earth green movements. They had a tremendous amount of interest in urban consumer horticulture and they didn't have the people to help. So they came up with the right idea of training citizen scientists, if you will, to learn about those horticultural concepts and turn around and volunteer and give that back in their communities. At this point, it's in just about, it is in every state in one form or another, uh, and it is international. There's an active program in Canada, uh, there's one in England, and there's an up and growing program in South Korea. Started here in Connecticut in 1978, I believe in the beginning we were teaching two classes a year. We're now up to five. Uh, we train about 200 people a year at this point with classes in four, well, all five counties and an extra class. We pair up our counties so that Tomland and Wyndham, for instance, are paired, Hartford and Litchfield are paired, and London and Middlesex are paired, and Fairfield and New Haven are paired. 
So the class is held in one county one year and in the other county the next year. And then we have an additional program at the Bartlett Arboretum down in southern Fairfield County uh, to serve that population down there because in this state, nobody seems to want to travel more than about 30 minutes to get anywhere else. So we have the initial training program where we train those volunteers. We also have an advanced certification program so that those trained volunteers can go further, get more education. And we also have in the alignment with that advanced program what we call our garden master classes, which are individual classes. Uh, we do two catalogs a year, one winter, spring, one fall into winter. Uh, the classes are the advanced classes. Master gardeners can take them for advanced credit, but they are also open to the public and with a slightly different pay rate. So it's a way that the public can get information on a topic they might be interested in, and it's also an entry into the Master Gardener program. Because they'll see it, they'll take a few classes, they'll go, oh, this is cool. Those classes range from in-class classrooms to tours to field workshops. Uh, we just finished touring the greenhouse in Wallingford for one of them. Uh, had a blast. Uh, we will go to various different arboretum and nurseries to learn about trees. This one was a pruning workshop. Yes, we get down and dirty and underneath those bushes. Uh, and then we also do some design classes and pest and disease management classes. Anything that's horticultural. We'll do some design ones. We'll do some that are what you might call the underwater basket weaving type things and Christmas design, but they're fun. And it involves plants. So what's involved with that initial program? And this is, we look at what's here and now we're gonna look at why we're changing it and how we know it's going to get better. The traditional program that we teach now is over 100 hours of classroom work. It's one day a week, January through April. So each class is held on the same day, five classes held around the state. After that, after they've done the book work, there's 60 hours of volunteer work, May through September of that year. 30 hours are in the extension offices or at the Bartlett doing plant clinic, answering diagnostic questions, answering community questions, and the other 30 are out in the community doing a community project of one form or another, working with an after school group, working with a food production farm for food share, uh, helping develop community gardens, all sorts of different pieces. And we do diagnostic clinics throughout the summer to hone these students' diagnostic skills. And additionally, we do what we call the tree vine shrub project, where they go out and create an herbarium essentially uh, of up to, I think we're at 28 different plants, uh, common woody plants and shrubs, so that they have a, a reference book of their own for the future. We discovered probably 15 years ago that they didn't know, the students didn't know their woody shrubs well, and how can you diagnose if you don't know what you're looking at? So we created this hands-on program so that they would have a very good sense of what identifying the tree and the shrub is like, and that's what this reference book. They all go, oh my God, from the beginning, when we tell them they have to go out and collect all these samples, and preserve them and write up the write-ups for it. And inevitably about half of them when they get done go, I'm gonna keep doing this, this is cool. Can I do more than 28? And it's like, yes, go ahead. Knock yourself out. Some of the outreach projects, these are Hartford County projects simply because these are what I have photographs of. Uh, we did a kitchen garden at the McKinney Shelter in Hartford. That was the space when we started. That was the space a year later. Uh, that is their chef the evening's produce. When Walnut Hill wanted to restore the Rose Garden that had been in New Britain, that's what it looked like, uh, I'm going to say seven years ago, maybe eight now, and that's what it looks like today. Uh, we worked with the Friends of the Walnut Hill Rose Garden to help with the horticultural information and the cultural information for building the Rose Garden. We work at the Hillstead Museum in Farmington and at the Mark Twain House in Hartford both being historical museums that have very low budgets, what else is new, and have trouble maintaining their properties and want to keep them looking historically accurate and beautiful. And this has been an ongoing back and forth, keeping us from becoming the groundskeepers. But what we do is we work with their volunteers, and we train their volunteers, 
on basic landscaping and garden maintenance. Yes, we're getting our hands dirty and doing it too, but we're not just their groundkeepers, we're teaching their people how to do these things. Uh, Mark Twain House, we also maintain the conservatory, uh, which is just a labor of love for some of my folks, and the plants are all historically accurate. So they are plants that would have been there in the Victorian era when Twain was there. Uh, and they come in a couple times a week and maintain it. We do a massive clean out every year. Uh, that is pretty much a hands-on just because people don't tend to get into the conservatory, they see it from a distance. <coughs> we work with the community farm of Simsbury, uh, developing a food production garden for the pantries in its gifts of love is the organization and they run the food pantry. And we built community gardens in Thompsonville. Again, empty space in town. This was a fun one where they called us up and said, we'd like you to help. We want to put a community garden in. And I said, well, let's start talking about fundraising because that's going to be the first piece. And they said, oh, no, no, no. I've got $30,000. <laughs> and I went, thank you. Uh, so that one went in very quickly. Uh, and in a tough section of town, a lot of concerns originally about would the food get stolen? How is this going to get handled? weren't going to feel safe. The nice piece is that right over here, there's a fire department. And what we did the first year was we gave one bed to the fire department, one bed to the police department for them to use. So there were folks around all the time. The very cool piece was the neighborhood got to see these people as human beings because they weren't in uniform and they were doing the same thing they were doing. And it, apparently it was an unintended consequence, but it worked wonderfully. By the end of the year, the relations in that section of town had distinctly changed. Gardening's not just about growing plants, it's about growing relationships. And then this is the signature project in Hartford. We have had an opportunity 12 years ago uh, to start a food share production garden at our farm at the 4-H Education Center in Bloomfield. And started out, I think they did 100 odd pounds the first year. And over the years, we've put in 40 odd raised beds, and we now produce two to 3,000 pounds a year of produce for food share. But along with that, we are teaching community members about gardening. Not only are our volunteers working on it, but food share sends in volunteers, and various organizations send in volunteers for those days of service that they tend to have. Uh, a lot of the kids who spend the summer in programs like the farms will come up, and UConn sends Every year, this was a group of medical students, foreign medical students who were over here uh, on one conference or another. And they spent the morning up at the farm with the kids from some local community group. And it was amazing listening to the conversations around that table. Every single one of the foreign students spoke a minimum of five languages. And the rest of us are all going to. Uh, somebody had pulled out a map at this point and they were showing the kids where they lived. Uh, most of them were from Africa. So we've been able to develop this program over the decade into a long-running community program involving both children and adults uh, and growing lots of food at the same time. And then just five years ago, I think, uh, we had the opportunity to put in a production greenhouse. Uh, one of those lovely grants where they call you up and say, we'd like to give you money. Okay, we'll do it. And at this point we have, it's a 30 foot production greenhouse, which is utilized all winter, except when we freeze everything in it, which occasionally happens. Uh, growing plants for the school programs at the farm, the education programs at the farm growing plants for various school programs in the community where they've got beds, garden beds at the schools, but they need a way to get the stuff started early. So we're developing programs where the kids are coming out and starting those seeds themselves, and then we will babysit them until they're ready to go to the classes. Uh, we also start all of the material for that production garden that's up at the farm. Uh, and we grow material to sell to raise money to buy protein. This has been a really, really fun project. We have Marlene Mays, who is the queen of the greenhouse and the farm. She's been a master gardener for about 11 
many years, um, and she has just shepherded this thing from beginning to end. And then that continued certification, once somebody becomes a master gardener, what do they do to stay certified? What do they do to stay relevant? Uh, one of the problems that we've had in the past is somebody gets a certification and they go off on their merry way, and 15 years later, you're in the grocery store and you hear them say, I'm a master gardener, I'm going to recommend this, and you go, oh my God, because all the information has changed. Because they haven't been around for that long. So we developed programs that will keep people in the loop. Uh, it's what we call our active certification. And they have to take what we call Hot Topics, which is an annual half-day class on topics of interest, maybe a new pest, maybe a new type of planning procedure, but something that will keep them up to date on the newest research in the gardening world, and they have to maintain that community outreach. They have to do community work, and they have to do work in the offices, which keeps them in our sphere of influence. We can bring them up to date on new material. We can correct things that they are not doing correctly. Uh, so they have to stay involved. Right now, who's involved in this program? If you look at our participants, there are limitations on who can take this class. It is one day a week, one full day a week for 16 weeks. They have to be able to carve that time out. When we do the introductions in class of who everybody is the first day, inevitably about 40% have just retired and have been planning on taking this class for years. I retired December 30 and it's now January 9th. Um, I, I've been waiting to take this class. Or we have people who have enough seniority or flexibility in their job situation that they can carve out a day a week, whether it's a vacation day or whether they have flex time. Uh, so, but it means that our average student is 55 plus. When I did the numbers on my class this year for the first time in all the years that I've been doing this, average age in my class is below 50. It's 48, but I'll take that. <laughs> They're predominantly female. Uh, that's more has to do with who gardens. Uh, it just tends to be a predominantly female hobby, if you will. Again, retired or with substantial approved time. Our groups now have significant personal gardening experience. Very few of them come in saying, I'm new to gardening and I want to learn. Which is good, because we are not an introductory garden class. But they have all gardened significantly in one form or another. They garden with their grandparents. Um, they, you know, maintain getting their hands in the dirt and they want to learn more. And they all tend to have a very strong environmental effort. So that when we're talking about sustainability and organics and going green, this is a group that is, we're preaching to the poor. Who are they? They're the baby boomers. So again, day long, weekday classes at six hours of lecture. Six hours of sage on the stage and it's a fire hose of information coming out to you. By two o'clock in the afternoon, you can see the eyes placing on it. They may be fascinated by the topic, but it's just too much information. We do very little practical hands-on stuff. That all comes later in the summer with the diagnostics. We need to be doing it now. And as we looked through and evaluated this class over the last few years, we started identifying these weaknesses. Uh, we shortened the class day. Shortened it by an hour originally, that helped, but still way too much information. Our students wander around with a binder that's three inches thick. They usually break it up. We suggest they do that so they don't have to carry it all in every week. Otherwise, they're like this. Uh, it's lots and lots of information, not necessarily the most coherently arranged. Um, they were getting so much stuff, they weren't retaining what we needed. And our current outreach format, those office hours are normal extension hours, which are Monday to Friday, 9 o'clock. Um, no Saturday hours, no Sunday hours, no evening hours. We are not reaching people, being available to people at the time that they are available. Client communication tends to be one-on-one -on -one via phone or email or face-to-face. -face. Um, and we pretty much require that the client come to us. If they've got a problem, they come to us. And this worked for a long time. This format was, was fine until something developed in the last 15 years. These guys, the internet. And the change in today's production plans. The largest client demographic 
It's a very different cohort than we were, than we are. These are the 18 to 40 year olds now. This is the largest cohort of first time home buyers. This is all Pew Trust um, data. They are environmentally conscious, but they do reject the label. They act environmentally consciously, but they don't see themselves as activists. They don't see themselves as environmentalists, but they're digital natives. This cohort lives and dies by this. They're urbanites as a rule, or suburbanites. Again, move towards staying in the cities, moving to the cities, it's a more urban population, and probably because of being a digital native and their familiarity with the internet, they want quick results. They want it, they want it now, they don't want to take a whole long time to see something come to fruition. So who are they? They're the millennials. So we have a bit of a disconnect between who we're teaching to and who is gonna be getting taught. So over the past few years, we have started looking at how do we start providing relevant information to this new cohort and still provide it to the older group. We're not, we're not negating us entirely. And also, how do we recruit from this group? This group is gonna be the group taking the class, and from that class, we have our volunteers. So we need to get them involved and have them find this relevant. And that conversation has been going on for at least two years uh, with some small steps along the way, changing the format of some of the <coughs> material in the manual, making sure that the material being taught is somewhat more updated. Um, and then last year, we took the plunge. Again, current program tools, losing effectiveness. Haven't lost it, but we're losing. Market share is at risk. So we started looking at how we're gonna use the internet, how we're gonna use computers, how we're going to reach this new population. And quite honestly, the tipping point for us was hiring a coordinator in Vernon, who is a retired IT director and teaches digital classes now, who is comfortable with the material, who can explain it to us normal, normal human beings. Um, as, she used, as she jokes, she's IT director because she works in the basement with all of those brilliant people who do this, but they could dress her up and she could talk normally. That's how she got the job. Uh, but Jean's arrival helped us start looking at this and not being entirely reliant on UConn's resources, which are stretched thin as it is. And even when we do use UConn's resources, we have somebody who can translate. And that has really been the jump start for this. We didn't want to go to a 100% online class. Again, we're looking for more hands-on interactive material. We're not gonna get that with a, with a full web class. What we wanted though is the ability perhaps to offer an evening class or a weekend class, and to be able to require a time commitment that people could work around. They can take a half day off better than they can take a full day off. So we went with a hybrid class structure where the week or so previous to class, a given class, there's gonna be three to four hours of material online using Blackboard. Uh, three to four hours of material online, it can be videos, it can be narrated PowerPoints, it can be written material that simply has to be read. We're still playing with all of the options that are out there. And then they come into class and it's three to four hours on the same topic, either expounding on a particular issue that wasn't clear in the lectures or is of particular importance, um, or doing small group and interactive exercises hands on and doing diagnostics every week as well. So they're getting the same amount of time but three or four hours of that is interactive, hands-on, diagnostic, refined, fine-tuned. They're getting way more of the hands-on of the applied than they ever got before. So we're not only giving them the information they need, we're giving them the tools to carry that information out to the public. And it provides much better training for them to translate all of that academic information to the average homeowner. We recognize that our current class makeup is not the most computer savvy, although more and more and more are. Um, we recognize that figuring out how this is going to work is gonna take some, some tweaking. So this year, we did two of the segments in this format. 
Mary Coughlin did the fruits segment in this format, and I'm doing the IPM segment in this format. So most of the class is the traditional class. They still have the four-inch manual. They still come to class for six hours a day. Um, but two of these classes are being done this way. We're through all but one of the fruits classes, and the response has been really, really good. Surprisingly so. We um, spent half an hour, obviously, after at, at the beginning of that first hands-on class, going, how was the experience? What troubles did you have? What problems did you have? Lots of very thoughtful feedback. Some of them very resistant to this until they spent the next three hours doing something hands-on and went, oh, this is cool. I like this. Um, some glitches with technology. Gee, what a surprise. We had that this morning. Um, we're going to have those for a while. Um, they're not the best online pieces yet this year, but it's first year and it's beta test. So we get a chance to, to leave. So this is how we started. Doing this became a very overarching project because now we said, OK, let's look at the curriculum as a whole. If we have to take out half of the lecture, how do we determine what half we keep in? So my Litchfield counterpart, Dave Lewis, and Jean and I have been doing curriculum review through most of 2016, going through all of the various chapters, figuring out what objectives, what measurables, what competencies we wanted, so that also when it gets to a point where we need to replace an instructor, because instructors do terrible things. I mean, of course, like we can't stand you. We have to get rid of you. Um, you know, they do terrible things like leave. Now it's not going to be, can you, who, who, who has the knowledge who can teach this? Now it's going to be, here is the material. Can you teach to this? So it's going to broaden who we can bring in. We can bring in good teachers who may not be experts in that field if they have the material to work with. So we did this whole curriculum review of the various parts. We developed those objectives and measurables. That was what we did as a program, and then we'd bring it back to the other coordinators and we'd hash it out, and, and it took a year. And then we start working with the instructors. In this case, Jean was working with Mary, and she's working with me, um, to figure out the digital content, to figure out what of that content is required, and what is resource reference and recommended reading. Uh, we ended up putting on what we call Mary's Bookshelf way more information than students ever had before and had to say, look, you only need to do this, 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 and this. They panicked when they saw 41 web pages for fruits. Um, and also work on the in-class materials that are going to be done in relation to it. So the instructor is still coming to class, but only for half a day. And for all of our instructors, all but one of them are extension educators, you all know what your schedules are like. Being able to carve it back to a half a day is going to make life, I think, a lot easier for you guys. Uh, in Mary's case, she's not even coming to class. She's doing two hands-on pruning workshops that the students will come to. Um, so they actually get that hands-on experience pruning. The trick was finding apple orchards who were willing to allow untrained hands on their trees. Luckily, the farm has an apple orchard that is so old, uh, we can do no damage to it. So we're going to play with that one. So just for now, this is the trees and small fruits module. Here are the objectives. Here are the concepts that are going to be covered. And here are what we expect the students to be able to do at the end of that class. So we've forced ourselves to refine it down in a curriculum review to what it is we want them to know. And again, we did two hybrid classes this year. This is one of the screens on Mary's. Here is her uh, narrated PowerPoint. They can print out the slide deck if they want to use it for notes. You can access the lecture there. Uh, so they go through, they listen to these. And we're finding out what's the length of time that this population can sit in front of a computer. Um, it's slightly longer than the millennials. They're willing to sit for almost an hour, our group is. We know we've got to shorten that down into shorter segments. Um, and then get the feedback from the students, the instructors, the coordinators, all of that, fine tune. And we've been able to recruit volunteers from within our classes. For instance, my class has five people in it who, along with Life in the Garden, have either webinar or web teaching or workshop experience doing this. And they're going to be able to pair them up with the instructors so that we can get the rest of the 
put online. And to a T, the instructors have said, great idea, love it, don't know how to do it, and don't have the time. So we're going to actually be able to pair them up with volunteers from our classes and probably from our Master Gardener recruit, our Master Gardener contingent, to actually do that physical translation, because Gene can't do everybody's. So by next year, January of 2018, our goal is to have this entirely a hybrid class and have at least one evening segment. Could you explain what you mean by that one evening segment? The in-class section right. will not be during daytime hours. It will be, say, 6 to 10. So you would do they would do their online. Two versions? No. no. It's all the same. I mean, I mean two, two separate offerings so that... We'll still have do, five classes. In one county, it'll well, be an evening class. One county will start. have an evening class. So and it isn't like you're going to say Tuesday morning you can come for four hours or Thursday night. We still keep our cohort, our classes, our groups okay. because we are county based and we work out of our counties. But we will have one that if somebody only can take it in the evening and they're willing to travel, right. they can, it probably will be burning because Gene's more than willing to do this. Okay. Uh, we're going to try it out we're going to see what happens. Uh, we may end up with three day classes and two evening classes, depending on demand. We'll rotate probably that evening class so that in different parts of the state in different years, it's available. Uh, this is all the sort of exciting stuff we're still figuring out. So again, we began curriculum review in 2016. We built out two classes this year. And next year, the plan is that this will be up and running. Lots to happen before then. We have to figure out marketing it. We have to figure out, we have to share with the instructors, um, oh, by the way, there's going to be an evening class somewhere. Um, we have to figure out if that's something they're up for or if we have to bring in other instructors to do other time frames. Um, there's a lot to still do, but with the core that we've got putting this together and with the support from the rest of the coordinators, um, we really feel this is doable and in this timeline. So, this gives us, you know, new potential audiences. The current audience that we have now, plus people still in the workforce, plus more students. We have students, interested students, as in somebody anywhere from 18 to 25, interested in taking the class, but they can't, because real school, quote unquote, gets in the way, uh, or work gets in the way. And we will see an increase, we already see this, but we'll start seeing, I think, an increase in the people who are considering a career change into the horticulture industry. We are not a jobs training program, but we brought this program from a program that used to be referred to by those of us in the industry as the ladies who lunch, and that was not a uh, compliment, um, to a program where when folks are going out and interested in working at a landscaping firm or something, the fact that they're a master gardener is a plus, that the education they're getting is sound and current and research-based that they know what they're talking about. And any number of people have taken this program, mostly women, because they hate where they work and they really want to do something different. They usually, these are some of our younger folks, they're usually in their 40s, and they just desperately want to see if this is going to work for them. And for a very large number of them, it does. I'm one of them. In 1999, I took this class. Oh, I thought in 1994. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Um, and I have aged days since. Um, in 1999, I was miserable at what I was doing in the corporate world and suddenly went, why don't I do what I love for a living instead of therapy? And the timing worked out and, and this, the personal situation worked out. And this was the start. And oh my God, you got me then and you're stuck with me now. And they have new audiences. Again, the current audience for clients, that older millennial group, which are the first time homeowners and renters now, this is a group that statistically are two generations removed from somebody who doesn't. None of them, very few of them, I can never say none, have experienced gardening with a parent, an uncle, an aunt, even a grandparent. They want to garden, they're interested in it, again, they're environmentally conscious, they want this stuff, but they don't know it, and they know they don't know. And then the younger millennials, the students, the curious ones, who, what, what is this 
this all about? Let me, let me see. I, you know, we see all these container gardens and we see all these cute things on decks. And you know, I, I, I grew a tomato last year and I'm really, really proud of that, but I think I can do more. Uh, so we've expanded that audience if we reach them successfully. And our outreach is going to change. We're not waiting for them to come to us. We can't because they don't come to us anymore. They come to us in a phone call saying, I looked this up on the internet and I'm really confused. And we say, join the crowd. Um, so we're going to go public. We're going to bring the office out. We can't necessarily open the office up on weekends, but we can go to farmers markets and have a booth. We can go to garden centers and work in cooperation with them on a Saturday morning for a whole day plant cleaning. And we can start creating digital content that people can access. Digital content that they know is research-based, relevant, and accurate. And we're even looking farther down the road, not that much farther down the road, maybe next year, that some of our master classes, those classes that are open to the public, will be online. Haven't gotten there yet. But as we look farther down the road, we had one of those brainstorming sessions around the table last year. We could start doing certificate courses for the public, not master gardeners, not with the full certification, but with a, with a certificate in integrated pest management or in veggies or in whatever. Um, and advanced specialty training modules for our students so that their advanced training is not just general training, but maybe specific training in woody trees, woody shrubs, or veggies, or lawns, so that they could get a specialty certification that way. Just expanding what we can offer, what we can teach, and what we can charge for. And that's it. Questions? So, what you were just explaining, is it in part, have you thought about doing, like taking all of the um, lectures that are online and having a lecture fee? Because I know in the past there's been discussion that everyone is, a lot of people are interested in the information, but don't want to commit to the whole certification. Precisely, so, yes. So that you would still be able to charge for access to that information? Many then, states do something like that now where you can attend the classes and not do the outreach and pay a much higher fee. Um, and we tried something more along the lines, we called it Hort Pro, where we were actually doing something with the idea that we were training people to then go to landscape firms, and for a variety of reasons that didn't, we, we tried to mesh two things that didn't okay. mesh. Uh, but yes, we by creating those shorter modules, those certificate courses, that allows somebody who doesn't want to do the whole program to get that education um, at a higher cost than they would if they did the volunteer work. We have to make sure we don't lose our volunteer base. Sure. Uh, that's that's who we are. I mean, first and foremost, we provide this community resource. Uh, so we have to make sure they want to stay in. The other piece about this is that because we are now utilizing the Yukon system, so this means everybody has to have a net ID, all that good stuff, that technical stuff that we're dealing with. But it means that in order to stay, to have access to the information, you have to stay active in the program. Otherwise, we shut your net ID off. So that while we already have a certification process each year, active certification process, it's the consequences are not high enough if they don't stay active. And we hear it. We hear, ah, I'll get back to that next year. If they want the information, we have the power to give that to them, access to them, and take it away. So they can carry it there, but they can always leave. But the issue that you were talking about about the typical detention hours and people, you know, needing assistance at other times. Have you thought about, you know, video chatting is a very simple thing that can be done. Maybe Absolutely. If there's a triage. You know, 50 percent of the things you could diagnose quickly. Absolutely. I mean, these are all pieces we're looking at. What we, and it all comes down to we have to go out. But that, that could be done from somebody's living room. Exactly. Outside. That's exactly. the beauty of it for both parties. Yeah. You know? And concurrent with this, we have now gotten and are in the process of converting to an online registration and course tracking program, uh, which will allow a great deal more to be done outside of the office in our jammies, if you will, um, oh. which is you know, a nice idea. Um, but so we're going to have a better tracking system for these people and for our volunteers so that we're going to be better able to say, yes, you are still current, no, we need to do this.
this, who do we need to you know, reach out to because they're drifting, all of that kind of monitoring mm -hmm. management stuff. One, two, and three. In the line of tracking, too, um, I love how passionate you are about all of this stuff. I, I love all those ideas that you put forth. I think they're really great. Um, but my the value meter is going off. It's oh, sure. in my head right now. Um, so can you speak to how you imagine evaluating this over time and how your evaluation approach for this program might change with these new uh, ideas? First and foremost, we're going to be chatting with you a lot. Uh, <laughs> In terms of, we, we already do very basic evaluation. I mean, we do pre-test and post. Um, and we do a lot of you know, the evaluation of the students. What did we do well? What did we not do? All that kind of stuff. Um, having developed these competencies for each, pro, for each class, we're going to be better able to evaluate, are we providing the information they need? Are we providing the learning they need? Because we have these specific competencies that we will test for in one form or another they're going to get tested on. Um, then it's going to be looking at how, what the response from the public is. Are we seeing that change in population that we feel we need to see? But then it's also going to be, not going to tell. Well, you said something that was very interesting about the fire, having a, the garden with the firemen and the policemen and how that yeah. maybe changed the way the community yeah, did. Yeah, it did. I mean, there's no question that it did. I mean, that's, that's and I have, I, I have the anecdotal on that. We, we weren't in a setup at that point to be able to go any more than anecdotal, but I have it. And, yeah. and you know, it's a, that was so cool. It was and that's the type of impact right. that you know, we want to be able to document yeah. and identify. Oh, it's somewhere in, from the year it happened. It's in the documentation somewhere, but that was a while ago. Nancy? I was just curious how you came up with the new class format and what kind of research, or did, did Jean help with that? Jean, as I said, Jean was our Kickstarter. Jean teaches these things. She teaches hybrid classes for Tuxus and um, somebody else. Um, and she was IT director at St. Joe's. So she comes from this background. And this is a format she was familiar with that would work on that we need to apply the hands on uh, and was doable. Are we going to evolve and tweak entirely? Probably, of course. Right. So I, this is, you know, this. Fulfills one of the boxes I wanted to check for myself uh, that we could actually move some of our curriculum online, and so I applaud your efforts, and I'm really excited to see how it continues to, to, to change over time. What did have you done any um, research to see what other states are in the same game that we are here on, you know, online master gardener programming? Where are they in this process? And what what sort of obstacles have they encountered, and what what things have what lessons have they learned that we might be able to leapfrog some of our own problems by sort of you know shared experiences, or do you feel like we would benefit from sending someone out to work with a, one of these groups who is kind of way on the front edge of this? Oh, I think I, no question. I mean, we are at the front of the curve, but we are not leading the curve. Right. Um, Vermont has been an interactive television class for years where they have a singular instructor and you know, in Vermont it's north south, you can't get east west. Um, they're not thrilled with it. They don't feel that the connection is there that happens with the in class, with the coordinator in the in class, and, mm -hmm. but they're dealing with those restrictions. Oregon State is probably, and Washington, but particularly Oregon, is far and ahead of all of the rest of us. Oregon has a full online program. For Master Gardens. For Master Gardens, right. Um, I don't know at this point how they, I know they have the, the volunteer requirements, the outreach requirements. I don't know how they handle um, sort of developing that, that core, if you will. One of our folks this year, I won't call her our student, but she's taking the Oregon program online mm -hmm. and will then do outreach with us and become a Connecticut Master Gardener because we're comfortable that Oregon's curriculum meets ours. Um, we may see some more of that. She was like, why can't you do what you're doing this year, you know, next year, this year? She may take the class again. Um, so Oregon, Washington, they're both out there. Wisconsin just put their program together. I just saw a piece on a seminar that they're doing 
So is there a national master gardener yeah. kind of meeting where this all gets? Well, there is a national master gardener's meeting, but there is no national master gardener program the way there's a national 4-H program. Right. It's all state by state by state by state. And, and that's, all our courses are different. Yeah, and I, and I, I don't, yeah. That, that makes sense to me in the sense that you're trying to reflect what your emerging clients are interested in. But last, maybe for a while, this last question. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent are people, you know, I, I think the Master Gardener program may have, I don't know this, but it may have started more in terms of, an, um, you know, sort of senior citizen gardening their flower beds versus who, you know, so what's the balance now? Have you seen a shift from people interested in, I think I want my lawn to look pretty, and I've now seen we're seeing more people interested in gardening for food, gardening community gardens, et cetera. It versus. started gardening for food, gardening for healthy living, it started, again, it was the green movement. It was not senior citizens, it was the 18 to 24 year olds. Okay. Um, but that was, that did that oh, revolution. And depending on the state, and depending on how the program was, and depending on the you know, public interest, it's gone back and forth. Okay. Connecticut's started more as that older individual, pretty flower beds. Um, that's where the ladies who lunch pejorative came from. Uh, it was garden club members. Yeah. And in the last 15 years, we've worked extremely hard to go from that garden club to this research-based volunteer group. Yeah. Uh, and, but depending on which county you're in, depending on which part of the state, you can see the different personalities and all of the different models. Yeah. Right. So um, I know we talked about the public speaking uh, facet of the program, and I wonder with the, with the new curriculum being rolled out in the way it is, if you intend on including more content around those softer skills and giving people Absolutely. that skill set <coughs> in, those, in those communities. One of the, and we've already started, one of the exercises that we did around the fruits module was break everybody up in the own groups of three or four, and they had a particular grouping of fruit that they had to basically distilled down to a three to five minute, I want to grow blueberries, tell me what I need to do. And they had to take all of this, and I called it the, the 50 floor elevator moment, because it's more than the two minutes, but it's also that you're standing in line in the grocery store and your neighbor goes, you're a master gardener, tell me about it, and you have captive audience. Um, and I had two of them do them as, as podcasts, just to get the idea of a different format, you know, and, and I had, the, one of the two groups that did the podcast, it was the youngest folks in my class. They were all under the age of 40. Um, one of them is actually 22. Um, and they did the podcast, you know, Welcome to Linda's Corner. And did I, I'm going to have them do those for their outreach. They were so good. But everybody had to stand up and talk. And it was done specifically with no grading, with no feedback till after everybody was done, so that there was no pressure. Just and we got done and I said, okay, you all learned that it's incredibly hard to do this in five minutes. And there's not a single one of you who can now tell me you haven't spoken to a group. And they all went, oh. So, Bonnie, Jeff, Bonnie, you got a question? I have a question. Um, I'm also really excited about you doing this. And um, I, can see, I can see that we're getting, we're, we're, you're gonna get to a point where I can stand in front of a room with my clients and part-times, especially millennials, and encourage them to consider taking the program. So that's really exciting. And I look forward to being, being able to do that. I guess I'm wondering about two different things. One is, I know you've been doing also a lot of work on the school gardens website. I'm wondering, where's the connection? Are you looking at those school garden coordinators as potential clients for the program? And are you marketing, gonna market it that way? I see them as potential clients, yes. And two, the work that I've been doing with that group has suffered greatly in the last six months. <laughs> I have not been present. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's clientele is not just the community at large, it can be the communities within the Yukon community or other school communities. Yeah. And how we can, again, it's things like growing the plants for the West Hartford schools and the Bloomfield schools. And we have the greenhouse, we have the resources, they can bring their kids in and have the experience, and then we'll babysit them until they're you know, ready to go. Yeah, I, I bring them on, <laughs> bring them on. And then my, my other question is, um, I guess it was Dean Liebman who used to talk about 
why can't we do a master gardener type of program for new farmers or new growers that are that are food focused? Yes. And I was just wondering if that was still an idea on the table. I mean, I, from a conceptual point, why not? I don't know who's going to step it, run it, and do it, yeah. but we could certainly help with that. Yeah. Because so, I think if you have this online format, mm -hmm. you can do it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and it's some of the things easy. that we've been thinking about are to do classes that are not part of the program, I guess maybe master classes, where most of it's online, but they get together for a Saturday right. and do something. Um, like the coastal certificate class, where there's some field trips and there's some classroom time. And the sky is the limit, and the fact that I'm so excited about this is testament to it, because you're looking at one of the world's last lives. I like books. I like pen and paper. I, you know, yes, I can't live without this anymore, but I don't like it. And for me to be going, wow, we can do this. This is a conversion of major, major proportions. So speaking to that, I really applaud you for going after the younger demographic and it will enhance and you know, ensure the continued growth of the program. Um, but what about those people that are one and two and I we that still have worked their entire life and they're going to retire and this is their bucket list and now we've just changed the game plan and they don't need this anymore? That's going to be part of our marketing. Okay. Um, we went through this when we Develop the first website, the UConnMasterGardeners.com, where we store all our class material. When we started saying you have to have access to a computer, when we started saying all communications can be via email, because we can't afford to do it any other way, and we thought this was going to be a huge problem, and it wasn't. It wasn't. There were bumps. There were there was resistance, but within two years, of course, we're all using email. There's. We actually have a student this year in my class who doesn't have a computer and doesn't do email. The younger guy, I mean, not yeah, that's that's right, right. We had to figure out how to get him an NID. He uses his wife's email address for that. And he goes to the library. And we said when he signed up, we said, look, you got to have this. And he said, I'll go to the library. And it's, it's working. We're going to have bigger problems with this because it's a right, bigger shift. We'll find ways. I mean, they can always come into the office and do it there with our, I mean, there are options there. But who's the biggest growing contingent on Facebook? Older people. Older people, age 55 and up. Oh, my 83-year-old dad. <laughs> I get one more. That's why there's no millennials on you Facebook. Get, uh, exactly. <laughs> Facebook, uh, Facebook is passe. <laughs> I mean, I like Facebook is passe. But that's just, show, was but home, just, just to give you the demographic, Granny's on Facebook and using it daily. So that's less of an issue to me. Anybody else? Any other questions? Good. You've been awfully quiet, Pam. Well, so I went on a California study. You know, I used to work for the program in entomology, and I was watching their classes online and not just um, because. about it was <clears throat> you know how I am uh -huh. all right I gotta have contact to be cool. um, the people that would be watching can't ask the question that's huge and that has come up in the discussion because it's timely when you're giving a lecture if people have a question they're not going to write it down I'm going to tell you right now they're not and so um, that only because you're going to have 50 questions in every class, as you know. And the other thing was hands-on is great, but in the winter, how much hands-on entomology can you get? We're going to have to prep ahead of time. We're going to have to figure that out. Why couldn't we go in the field and do it there later in the year? We could. Uh, this, is all, it. this is all This is all out there. Now, as to the first right. question. Yeah, no, the first question. Insects are tough. You turn this tough in the winter. It's like it's all dead. What, yeah, we are going, what we are going to encourage people to come to class with questions. And they did with Bruce. Okay, good. They did come with, I didn't get this, I didn't get this. Two, okay, there are going to be online quizzes, and we can see how the scoring went. So we can see. After. After. We can okay. see, but, you know, they do their, their four hours or whatever, and their, and their quizzes throughout, right. perhaps, or maybe one at the end. Yeah. 
we're going to be able to go in and see which were perhaps the most missed questions. Okay, this topic they didn't get. We know to bring that up in class. So that would be ahead of the lecture. Now so you get to prepare. But you could, you could also, you could do live chat. I mean, either live or time delay chat where somebody can pose a question. Oh, I just had this really crazy question. You know, we have, we, we're not wedded to this. Oh, I'm just asking. No, that, I, no, I think it's a really good question. Right. And it is the kind of thing that we're looking at is how do we, the question that came up after I was skewered into Bartlett on Monday. Um, that's a tough crowd. Yeah, it is. <laughs> was how can you do online tests because the answer has to be so is it fire blight one word or is it fire space blight? Oh yeah. Right. And I brought this back to Jean going, are we gonna even be able to do online testing? And she said, Yes, because you're gonna do online testing that has short answer pieces and you're still gonna have to look at them. But your true falses will be automatically graded. Your you know, a chunk of it can be automatic. Still going to have that interactive piece. The other thing you could do. I thought you said last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can embed links right. and further information in your video. So at that time, you, you can push yeah. pause and then look down, and it'll have a link or information for you that's that's more in depth. About at our at the that. moment, our biggest problem is a technical one in that media site seems to not work well with tablets, and when people uh, pause it, it freezes. But that's a technical glitch. That's yeah. for you, I guess. But and, and that's that will be a problem if they can't pause it mm -hmm. and move forward. That's going to be a problem. Um, and just one more. Of course, because <laughs> the evening class. Yep. You said it was four hours. Might be three. I mean, we're, we're, we're figuring four out. hours to me at night if I was working all day. I, I'd be a mental. <laughs> <laughs> and and do you know what I mean? I, I know exactly what you mean. Maybe it's two two hour sessions. Uh, we can. We that's, can that's even right. better because really, that's we we can't. You know, for instance, Mary just couldn't do the in-class piece, but she can do two coding sessions. Yeah, see, is that, that valuable? Is, Absolutely, that to me is way better, especially in talent, because you can get people from all over the place with right. talent. So maybe when we get to entomology, you have the coordinators do the in-class, which is what we did for groups. Mm -hmm. The coordinators are going to be doing much more teaching than they've done in the past. They're going to be active teachers in this. So we don't have to go. Well, we want the experts there, <laughs> but your your expert. It may be that we're out in the field in Holland on a bug hunt. To me, though, yeah, you know how that goes. We are white. I just tell people I'm going to be somewhere. I have a crowd of people there. The most valuable thing for us in all so, of this has been forcing ourselves I would be out and do it. to refine yeah. down what we're teaching. All right. That volume was not volume. Yeah. Volume was yeah. just volume. Getting out and seeing it. Having to edit yeah, mind pieces down to four hours. I know. Once I got over the initial, oh, but they have to make this. No, they don't. They don't need that today. No. It's a much cleaner, much more concise, much more likely to be remembered lecture. See, I have PSDS. Pretty. Yeah, lunch. Lunch? Oh, yeah. I like it. It looks like, uh, looks like we have Bloody Mary. <laughs>